for giving me this uh, great opportunity to uh, discuss with you today about this fascinating topic, uh, the messaging standards. Uh, we have been working uh, with the task force at EXDA for a couple of months now, discussing how the messaging standards should or would evolve in the future, and I would like to discuss with you the main conclusion. So after ever having explained a bit where we stand today, cover the key challenges we are facing regarding those messaging standards, we will come up with some few recommendations that we would like to apply in the coming years. But before that starting, just to set the scene, I would like to remind you that we are facing coexistence of multiple standards in our day-to-day -day life. You know, we have different ways to express temperature in either in Celsius or Fahrenheit. We never manage to agree on which standard to use for, for mes the measurement of things. Is it the imperial system or is it the metric system that should prevail? And a very concrete example can be also applied when I won't like to charge my phone. If I would ask you, could you please give me your phone charger so that I can plug mine, you would most probably ask me, which standard are you using? The sa exact same questions would apply if you want to connect a participant to a CSD or to any financial institution. You would first ask, if you want to connect, could you tell me which standard you are going to use? And in the financial industry, and especially in the post-trade environment, there are two main standards that are being used. The ISO 20022, which is the newest one, and the ISO 15022 that you most probably know well. These are all the empty messages like MT564, MT548, etc., which are commonly called as SWIFT messages because they are, in many cases, transferred over the SWIFT network. So as I said, we managed to survive in our day-to-day -to -day world about using multiple standards, and we will probably survive as well in the financial industry. And back to my previous example, what are our options to survive to these multiple standards? If I go back to my example about the phone, we have two main options, I would say. Either the coexistence, and to address that, you can go on Amazon, pay five euros, something like that, to by this small converter. So thanks to this small five euro converter, you can use both USB-C standard or Apple standard to plug your phone. The other way to address the coexistence of standards is the second case, apply a full migration. So basically discontinue one of the way you have to plug your phone or to plug your counterparty. It's again exactly the same in our industry. You could pay for the five euro converter so that you can transform your ISO 15022 message into an ISO 20022 message. And by the way, these are small examples of those formats for those who have never seen them. So this is the first option, build a converter. The second option would be, again, I don't know if you see it, it's, it's the seed here, but it would be to, to get rid of one of those standards. And for instance, oh, sorry. for instance, to, um, to uh, discontinue the old standards, so discontinue the ISO 15022. I can already tell you two things about this slide. First of all, the converter on the right side is just a tiny bit more expensive than the one on the left hand side. You know? <laughs> the second point, and sorry it's a bit of a spoiler, if you don't want to hand, already hear the end of my story, please shut your ears because I can already tell you that we will land somewhere a bit in between those two situations, a bit of coexistence and a bit of migration. But before going more in detail into those considerations, let me give you some arguments and some reason why we are more and more talking about the new standards, about the ISO 20 or 22. This slide, I agree, stays a bit the obvious. So when you want to do something, why would you do it? First, because it makes sense. Second reason could be that you have no other choice. It's a very good argument when you ask your management to take a decision because with this argument, they actually not, do not have to take any decision because it's mandatory. The third one could be a high recommendation from market standards, for instance, like James was illustrating in the, in the previous uh, discussion. And the last argument, the one which is a bit of huge proof, is uh, the, the, the huge proof argument is more inspiring and gives you um, future opportunity. 
So if I illustrate that in my case of uh, ISO messages, when does it make sense? Let's just take an example. Let's assume you want to announce a meeting, uh, a general meeting announcement. So you want to send a message over the SWIFT network, for instance, to notify your participant that a general a meeting is taking place. So you want to list all the resolution at the agenda of your meetings. In the ISO 20 or 22 message, you have a clear field to give the ID of the resolution, then the title of the resolution, and then the long description of the resolution. Then next resolution, you do the same, ID, title, label, etc. This is what you can do in 20 or 22. If you would do it in 15 or 22, it would look a bit like this, a kind of free text format. So this free text, when you want to announce a general meetings in either 15 or 22, you are more or less have to put a free text in your message. When you do it in 20 or 22, it's much more structured. So this really makes sense in this specific case. Obviously, just an example, it works fine with meetings. For other domains, the added value is much more limited. If I take other corporate actions, for instance, you can structure things in the same way in both formats. The second case where you implement ISO 20 or 22, and James mentioned it again um, earlier today, is when you are obliged to do so. For instance, with the shareholder right, uh, right directive, uh, most uh, market participants in Europe were almost forced to implement ISO 20 or 22 for the general meetings and the shareholder identification. Another case where you have to use ISO 20 or 22 is when market infrastructure imposes it. Like for instance, if you want to communicate with target two securities, you have to use ISO 20 or 22. It will be the same with a future platform ECMS. And we know that some CSD are already imposing 20 or 22. The next situation is when there is a market standard highly recommending the usage of ISO 20 or 22. James was mentioning earlier again the score standards, and in this score standard it's mentioned that all intermediaries should be able to support ISO 20 or 22 in the coming years, which means it's not strictly recommended, it is not a law, but it's really strongly recommended because um, there is a market agreement to take that route. And finally, the last argument, the most inspiring one, this future-proof argument, is the fact that we can go a bit beyond messaging. You know, ISO 20 or 22 and all those ISO messaging standards are usually seen as to be used only for messaging, but it should go beyond that because this is a result of a standardization effort that took place over, year, over the past years and we can reuse the richness of the data dictionary that has been built on this. So you have all the financial concepts that have been described in, this, in those standards. So even if you develop other communication interface, like application programming interface, for instance, you should use those, um, those elements of the data dictionary. So you see, there are some good arguments to start the migration. During this, um, this, all this discussion at the task force at EXDA, we uh, consulted all the CSD in, the, in Europe, all the EXDA members, to see where we stand today in terms of uh, ISO 20 or 22 readiness. I just covered two examples here, asset servicing and settlement, and we see the trend is a bit different. On the asset servicing side, we see we are gradually moving towards ISO 20 or 22, mainly because it was imposed by SRD2, so the Shareholder Right Directive 2, and also because the score standards are coming and are strongly recommending the implementation of ISO 20 or 22. So there, the move is there, the trend is moving gradually towards 20 or 22, but no one really wants to already stop the old format. On the other side, for settlement and reconciliation, despite the fact that within Europe, everyone connected to T2S must use the new format, the older one is still the main one, and counterparties still believe it should be used for still a couple of years. So we more probably move a bit uh, at a lower speed for the settlement and reconciliation. So you see on this slide that we are already in a situation where both standards coexist. For instance, we use it for T2S, but we don't use it in all the tra settlement transactions. This creates some challenges, and the main challenges related uh, to, the, to the coexistence are the following ones. 
Again, it looks like the arguments, all the arguments you would put if you don't want to do something, but it doesn't, make, doesn't work in all the cases. It creates sometimes limitation, it can be costly, uh, and it's sometimes risky. As I say, it looks like you, something you don't want to do, but actually we have to nuance a bit that because it can work in, ma in many cases. But let's just illustrate what it means. First case, it doesn't work in all the cases. Back to my example. If you want to make a translation of this kind of meeting announcement as a free text, if you want to put that in a very structured format, it can be quite challenging because you have to interpret the data. So typically, for a situation like the announcement of a general meeting, it doesn't work very well. For some of the cases, as I, as I was saying, settlement, corporate action, the translation is much more easier. So it works in a large majority of the case, but sometimes the translation is a bit complex. Another point is that it creates limitation. It's a bit technical because it's talking about technical format details. So to make it easier, let's maybe take an example. Let's assume that you have to report a postal address in a, in a message. For instance, for tax reason, you have to put a the postal address or for shareholder identification, you have to put the name and address. And let's take an example. For instance, do we have French people in the audience? See, we have some indeed. Maybe some of you are living in Paris. I won't ask you your private address. No, 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 because the European legislation does not allow me to share that in such a large audience. So let's take an assumption. Let's assume you are living in the best avenue in the world. No, how, how do you call it? The, the most beautiful avenue in the world. So you are living in the Champs-Élysées. You have to report that in a message. So if you want to say that our postal address is Avenue des Champs-Élysées, in ISO 20 or 22, it works perfectly fine. In 15 or 22, you would say you are living in the Avenue des Champs-Élysées. Why? Because you can't support the special characters in the ISO 15 or 22. You can't say A, the A of Champs-Élysées is a special character. So the new message does not support that. Another limitation is on the, 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 the size of the fields. You know, usually in the older format, so in the 15022, the, the fields are a bit shorter. So if I go back to my previous example, in 15022, you would say the address is Avenue des Champs-Élysées. In 20 or 22, you have enough space to say it's Avenue des Champs-Élysées, and you have even enough space to put between brackets which is the most beautiful avenue in the world. Does it make sense? I'm not fully sure about that, that we should put a uh, subjective observation in a message, but it maybe illustrates a bit the reason why the, the business and the industry is struggling to find the business case to migrate to ISO 20 or 22. It clearly brings more feature because you can add special characters, you could put longer things, but does it really worth the investment? And that's, I think, a good illustration of the fact that it brings value, but I'm not sure it always brings enough value. Then the next point is um, quite obvious. It's more costly to tr manage two different standards in parallel because you have tried to translate it with a with your counterparty, you have to manage two versions of two different messages. Um, some of you would say it's not that expensive because our software can handle that easily. You know the five euro converter is, is, is quite easy to implement. In some of the cases, some of you might say you have to pay twice for the business analysis, you have to pay twice the development, twice the testing, twice the documentation. So obviously the, 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 the level of cost will differ for each of us but certainly there is a small additional cost at the minimum for maintaining both. And the last one, it's the fact that it's a bit risky actually, because you know, as you don't have exactly the same format in all the message, if you want to implement the coexistence, and if you give, for instance, for a corporate action as a CSD, we are usually uh, one of the first to announce, the, the, the inform, give the information in the holding chain, so if you assign a corporate action ID and use it in 20 or 22 with a big field and send it to someone else down the chain who convert it in 15 or 22, he will lose some information. So that's the reason why it's really important to make sure that we implement good coexistence rules to make sure that this truncation of information does not take place because we all know that we don't like transforming or losing information when we exchange it with, uh, with our counterparties. 
And this brings us to the last part of this presentation, the recommendation. We have came up with three main recommendations regarding um, the coexistence of the standards. The first one, which I was just explaining, is the um, coexistence rules. Make sure that we can translate the information easily with the different format we are using with the different counterparties. This means use limited character set, for instance. A PT, we won't be able to put Champs-Elysees in a nice way in the message, but we could still survive with that. Limit the size of the fields, and there, be careful, it's usually a bit longer in the new format, so in the 20 or 22, it's usually a bit longer, but sometimes it's the opposite. For some fields, they are longer in the old format, so there again, rules will be put in place. The other two points below the slides are quite important as well, because you might know that in the current empty message, or in the 15.022 message, every year in November, we implement what we call the Swift release, and everyone switch to a new version of the message, which means that at each time, uh, we have only one version of the ISO 15.022, which is valid. In 20.022, it's a bit different. When you create a new version of the message, the old one can still be used, and we have to be very careful with that, because this could mean that with counterparty one, we have to use ISO 15022. With counterparty two, we would have to use ISO 20022 version one of the message. With, I, with the counterparty three, we would use ISO 20022 version two, which might soon become a big mess because you would have as many versions as counterparty. So this is again a point that for which we have to be very careful and try to find an agreement to use a very limited set of versions. The next recommendation, which I agree is probably the most controversial one in this slide deck, is about defining uh, a path to uh, fully migrate to ISO 20 or 22, at least when it makes sense. What we observe here is that for the corporate action domain in Europe, we have the score standards that are coming quite soon and that are saying that as of November 2025, all actors should be able to support ISO 20 or 22. This is the recommendation of the score standards. I think the date is still subject a bit to discussion, but that's the point that everyone should normally support 20 or 22. So if everyone can support 20 or 22, does it still make sense that CSD would support both formats? Wouldn't it make sense to say we fully migrate to 20 or 22 if our clients are, or participants are ready? But we don't want to go too fast. What we propose is that after the score standard wave two, so the time when everyone is supposed to, to be uh, equipped with 20 or 22, we would give five more years for everyone to do the migration to either 20 or 22, and then in 2030 propose to decommission the old format uh, at European CSD level. For the general meeting, we are even a bit more ambitious and would like to do it a bit more sooner. Reason for that is that in Europe, many of us and many intermediaries are already fully equipped with 20 or 22 because of the shareholder right directive. So there we believe that three years might be a good timing to discontinue 15 or 22 from, from the CSD. On the other side, for settlement and reconciliation, we don't see a big appetite for the moment from the community and a lack of maybe of readiness to fully migrate and we prefer to wait a bit before giving a date. Then the last recommendation is a bit more broader because it goes a bit beyond messaging. As I was explaining earlier, ISO 2022 is not only a messaging set, it's also a data dictionary. So if you want to use information in any ways in which you exchange information with your, uh, with your counterparties, which include APIs, obviously, we strongly recommend to use the ISO 20 or 22 data dictionary. If we do not do so, each of us might define different API, different application programming interface, with different terminology, with different way to, uh, to structure the information. And this would mean that we might go back a couple of years or even decades ago where everyone was using a proprietary format. So if you go for more modern technology like API, I would strongly suggest to uh, use the ISO data dictionary to build them. And there is even a way to fully register an API so that even the API interface is considered as ISO compliant. 
Those three recommendations conclude this short presentation. So just to recap, what we recommend is to apply strong coexistence rules to implement the, the small converter, define the decommissioning timeline when it makes sense, and also avoid slipping towards a proprietary world where everyone would be using its own data set in APIs. You will find much more details about the, the, the work that has been uh, taken place at, uh, at this task force in um, the paper that will be issued very soon, and I think uh, will be issued even today. So please feel free to reach out to me or XDA if you have any additional questions uh, when you will be reading this paper. Um, I don't know if we have uh, a bit of time to take some questions, but anyway, I would like to thank you a lot for your attention. I know it's not an easy topic on a Friday morning because it's a bit technical. Um, thank you very much. And if anyone has questions, don't hesitate to, to raise your hand. So indeed, uh, we will be taking the questions, but Jean-Paul, you also have some questions for you. I hope that they can be indeed used uh, on the screen uh, right now as well. But first, indeed, let's be taking the questions from the audience or, or comments, right? So if you do not have any questions, perhaps some of you may be willing to say something about it. Yes, please. Middle of the room. Thank you, uh, Hugh Simpson. Uh, we heard a lot yesterday about um, new technologies or DLT. How do these traditional data tra formats translate into the new world? I, I would say it's really linked to the last recommendation, the fact that you can use ISO model uh, in new way of communication. I think that for the DLT uh, and similar technologies, APIs are, I think, the preferred way for communication. And there, I think we should avoid making, again, proprietary uh, ways to communicate. And I think there, using the ISO data dictionary would really make sense because at the end, we are talking about similar concepts than the one we are talking uh, today. And you can always enrich this data model. So it's not because the concept does not exist today in this data model that you can't uh, extend it. But doing that, putting ISO 20 or 22 within communications related to the new technology will certainly help in having something um, really standardized. Jean-Paul, it is not the picture of you that we have been taken, although we have taken some. It is the slide that already some of us have been looking, which is behind you. Uh, perhaps indeed we can be taking the first slide or question as well and see the outcome. It seems to be <laughs> quite balanced about the usage today of 20 or 22. So we are maybe in the middle of the journey, just going to the transition. Um, Gradil moving, indeed. And of course, if you are not a CSD, feel free as well to respond. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's good to see, indeed, whether it is used in the industry altogether, I think. So it looks like there is a journey, right? Yeah. And it prob nothing. probably quite differ depending on the business domain. I, I, I guess the answer would be quite different depending on which domain we are talking about. But. It's, it's, I think it's a quite fair representation. Okay, should we be taking the second question? Indeed, I hope that the speech of Jean-Paul has motivated some of you as well <laughs> to change your decision, at least for the future. Of course, you may need to discuss it further, right? Uh, with the management, with the CZ community. Uh, but it would be good to see already your uh, initial ideas with regard to that today. So we have the next question which is appearing. Yeah, this one is a quite interesting one because it's linked to the, the score standard. You know, with the score standard, at least in Europe, we say that we should support 20 or 22 by 25. And I, so far, I think it's quite aligned because the majority seems to be, uh, to be there, to be ready. And, and it's probably go a bit beyond Europe because you know score standards are many, uh, to the European markets, but I think as we have a larger 
large number of fees. This might be a, a bit larger than Europe where everyone would start, many of us would start uh, supporting 20 or 22, which is, I think, a good thing. And so we have a question from Andrea Gentilini. So um, our Luxembourgish regulator. So yes, please, Andrea. Um, curious about the last question. Um, would you envisage that the, in the forthcoming CSDR review, uh, there will be, we say, a push from the legislator to enhance and uh, motivate C European CSDs to use uh, uh, more the ISO 2202? Yeah, that's a, that's a quite tricky question, actually. Um, it would definitely help, at least for the CSD, it would be good to say, okay, the regulation pushes to the commission something, so that would be fine. On the other side, does it really, is it really something we want to do to really force the market to even, uh, if they wouldn't be fully ready? Um, but I'm not even sure that legislator would want to go in such a details because even if you look at SRD2, we always take the shortcut saying that it has imposed ISO 20 or 22 for general meetings, but it's not actually written like that in the, in the regulation. It says that you should use ISO messages and give the list of the fields you have to support, which means you have no other choice to than using the general meetings ISO 20 or 22 message because there is no equivalent in 15 or 22. But if you would make the same statement, and if it's actually the same statement in shareholder right directive, it was saying that for corporate action, you should use ISO message this is the list of fields, and as it's matched with ISO 15022, we all kept ISO 15022. So I don't know if the, 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 it would make sense from a legislation point of view to go that far in imposing a, a, a very technical It is generally format. never done, right, indeed, to propose a specific standard in, well, certainly not in, in level one legislation, which is really the core text, perhaps sometimes in the standards we do have it for the reporting, right? But perhaps to use your own words, Andrea, when the goal is clear, then I think the entire industry can be working together on how to achieve it. And here you see a commitment, at least from the European industry, indeed. Thank you. Should we be taken um, to last questions? I think there is a question. From the, uh, there, there is a question from Sharifa who is coming from SWIFT indeed and will be making the second presentation. And of course, SWIFT is quite a player, right, in the ISO messaging, so Sharifa. Thank you, Anna. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank you for the work that you've been doing um, from a SWIFT perspective. This is extremely important to us to hear it from the industry. Uh, it's not really our purpose nor our role to dictate things. Um, so very welcome this, this perspective. What I'd like to say is, and I'm turning to the audience right now, um, we do have a very large community at SWIFT, 11,000 players, 6,000 of them active in the security space. We'd like to hear from the rest of the world as well. So please get engaged. Please share your own perspective on this uh, ISO 1502, 1502 2002 coexistence. Um, the second point I wanted to mention, and it's linked to the question that was raised around digital assets, tokenized assets and DLT. Um, it's a bit like in the standards world, right? Um, traditional and digital ecosystems are going to coexist. And in order for us to achieve the goal that uh, Andrea was mentioning in terms of achieving efficiency, making things work and, and services adopted, we will go through a coexistence in the digital space as well. And what we've been doing uh, within as part of the standard maintenance releases, uh, I believe we started somewhere in 2019, 2020, is to update the MT and the MX messages to carry digital information. So that is also extremely important until we find what is the future way of communicating in a digital asset space, be it APIs, as you said, Jean-Paul, uh, trying to stick to the ISO 2022 data model or anything else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arifa. Thank you. Okay, so uh, perhaps we can be having the third question uh, from Slido. Oh, yes, sorry, it's not, I will, it's there. Um, so the question was to know if it would be feasible uh, to fully migrate corporate action to ISO 20 or 22 by 2030, as suggested on, on the second recommendation. Just 
interpreting a bit the result, but I think it's quite positive because we have very few no's so far. Uh, and if you, you add the ones wanting to do it, so the yes, and we'll try to do our best, we, we are reaching almost 80%, if my, my arithmetic is correct. So I think it's, uh, it's a quite good feedback. Thank you for that. Thank you very much indeed, yeah, much appreciated. So the last question from Slido, please. So the last one will be not about corporate actions any longer, but about settlement. Yes, the question was to know if you would believe that taking similar approach for settlement and reconciliation, so meaning start discussing about a, an end date for 15 or 22, would this make sense or not? And indeed, 10 years looks like quite a long deadline, right? Which may be sufficient indeed in this specific case. So perhaps even for settlements, we can be yeah, a bit more ambitious indeed. Or at yeah. least setting something <laughs> very specific. Yeah, I think it's a very good result to see more than 70% saying that we, this would make sense indeed. So maybe an update on the next WFC to, <laughs> to come with a recommendation about settlement. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Jean-Paul. So do not Thanks hesitate, of course, to uh, discuss with him during the break. Thank you.